I wish I could fix that. <laughs> yeah. yeah that's, that's, a lot, a lot of logistics involved in that. Well, I'm going to be talking to you guys about device drivers. This is the one case where you know either everybody likes what you're doing or everybody hates what you're not doing. So. <laughs> <laughs> or both. Or you know both at the same time, I guess. Anyway, let's talk about the ACPI project for a little bit. Some of you may have heard this before, but I kind of like to go over it again because there is a lot, it's a, it's a very complex project and there's a lot going on here and it's very important and a lot of people really don't understand how it works or what exactly it is. But the ACPI project provides you these five different things, the PSD, the uh, library, which allows applications to use ACPI services. There's a daemon, which is basically just an application that provides various services that are common, like when you press the power button or you open the lid on your laptop, it's this thing that captures those events and then makes something happen. And then there's the APM emulator, which is a little driver that intercepts APM functions and calls and tries to interpret them and emulate them using ACPI functions instead. And then there's a toolkit for writing the applications. Now something I haven't had in my previous presentation that I made right here is a picture of how all this fits together. There's the block on top, which is essentially your computer, which has a BIOS in it, and in that BIOS is the ACPI. Now a lot of people think that the software that I provide is ACPI. It is not. The ACPI lives in your BIOS and is provided by the vendor who sold you your computer. The PSD has a little component in it called ACPI CA. That's the component architecture that is provided by Intel. Intel writes this code. We just simply download the latest version and compile it into the PSD. We don't modify this code, we don't debug this code, we don't do anything to it other than use it as is from Intel. It's the little piece of code that talks to the ACPI, which is, of course, in your computer already. And it, basically the ACPI is an interface, that's what the I stands for, and it's a bunch of tables and methods and things that tell about your computer. Tell us all about the hardware, where things are located, what the addresses are, how to do various things in your computer. And of course, because your computer is unique, it has to be supplied by the vendor. There are a bunch of other things in the PSD besides the ACPI, ACPI CA that are OS2 specific services. And IBM, in their infinite wisdom a long time ago, created an interface for it, kind of like plugging into the kernel to do various things that may have become obsolete and need advanced support, like for example, advanced interrupts. Way back when, when the OS2, OS2 kernel was built, it didn't, they don't know about advanced interrupts. They only know about PIC interrupts. That's just one example that the PSD, which stands for Platform Specific Driver. That's what PSD stands for. So anyway, that's the major component. That's where 99% of the work goes in in the ACPI project, is in building this PSD, making sure it works, and getting it to do things. Every time something new comes along or something changes in hardware, it needs to be handled in this PSD to make it compatible for the operating system to run. Underneath the PSD, there's the DLL, ACPI 32 DLL. This is an application interface which lets other applications use the ACPI services which are in your computer. Things like measuring the temperature of the CPU or rebooting the machine. You know, these are the sorts of things that are done by the BIOS, and just, they're just function calls. The PSC doesn't actually do those things. It makes function calls into the BIOS to actually perform these operations, because they might be different on every piece of hardware. The daemon, of course, is an application, just like any other application. It talks through the DLL and just runs various things in, in different threads. Of course, there's the APM module sitting over there on the side. 
And then also the toolkit is essentially a, a, some header files and library which lets you write applications to use ACPI services. And anybody could do that. Um, for example, if you wanted something to monitor, I don't know, something like maybe time or you wanted to blank the screen or you wanted to do whatever else that needs AP, ACPI services, you could, anybody could write an application to do these various things and do exactly the same things the daemon does. You can just do it differently if you wanted to. There's no restrictions in that regard. There's no privileges required or anything. You can do all that sort of stuff. You can query battery levels. You can take actions based on battery levels. You can query the temperature of the CPU. You can query all sorts of things like that and take actions based on those. Any application can do that. That whole middle box there. Now, is that all new stuff that OS2 did not originally come with and has now been supplied or? The bottom dashed box? Yeah, I mean, I think of it from the bottom up kind the of. The bottom so. dashed box is everything that the ACPI project produces. Okay, but in terms of, like if I bought OS2 20 years ago, would it have had any of those things? No, in the, the none middle? of this. Okay, that's my question. That is correct. And the other apps, I noticed I stuck it outside the bottom box because it's not the responsibility of the ACPI project to write these other applications for you. That anybody can write these applications. Okay? Is that more clear maybe about exactly what's what and where and how it fits together? So how did OS2 do something years ago to like, you know, power down or turn the screen off? Uh, how, how did that happen? Or didn't it do it? Well, it probably didn't do it unless there was other support from external modules. Okay. And it, it did interfere, there, there was APM back okay, then. Okay, so that I guess that's capable, the thing that, okay. That was capable of yeah. doing that. You could never power and off. This, this, <laughs> yeah. yeah right. And as we all know, we, OS2 never powers off. I mean, you can wall it in a closet and it'll still run, right? Yeah. For years yeah. and years and years. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, the APM module there is kind of an emulator. It, okay. it literally is an emulator. It, it tries to emulate as best it can APM functions using ACPI gotcha. calls. And there's not a one-to-one -one match, so it tries to do the best it can. Okay. Moving on. The um, ACPI project is fairly stable now. There's not a whole lot of development unless things come up. However, I do update the... Um, the oh. The Intel part? The Intel part. Yeah. Let's see. There we go. I do update the Intel part. And it's updated monthly. Intel comes out with monthly updates to that. And it's, you know, when you see the little change log at the bottom, sometimes there'll be two or three of them that I've applied since the last release. Um, it is, a, I consider it a stable a stable project now, and um, version 3.23.04 is in testing now and should be released fairly soon. So that's not a, not a big change, but there is changes coming. Is that because of QS and NIT compatibility? Um, it's because of the major change here for support for 64 interrupts. Oh. Because only 32 interrupts are supported by the kernel. And a lot of the hardware that's coming out these days simply won't run with less than 50 or so interrupts. They, they just, they've wired it up that way. And another thing that the uh, motherboard manufacturers are doing is even though the old PIC hardware is on the motherboard, it's no longer wired up fully anymore. So using something like virtual wire mode or PIC mode in the, uh, for the PSD, you can, you can limit the PSD, you can uh, drop down and use virtual wire mode, um, even that won't work on some motherboards anymore because the picks aren't wired up anymore. They're there, but they're only partially wired up. Some of the, like the network controllers, the sound controllers, they're not wired up to the pick anymore. So it would, became kind of necessary for me to implement this major change. And um, version 3.2303, it wasn't quite complete. I missed a couple of things that I needed to patch to um, to make it work, so this is fixing that. There are also some minor improvements like the ACPI C8 updates. Um, it better integrates into the kernel. The uh, PSD is essentially a kernel plugin through a, a defined interface that IBM provided. It, it, it runs in cooperation with the kernel, so it's pretty tightly integrated into the kernel. 
and it, it improves automatic configuration. There were a couple of situations where it didn't quite detect what was required for the hardware, and now that's better improved for you know, once again, as things change in the hardware from the vendors, the PSD will have to change to accommodate those, and that still is ongoing, and I consider that maintenance. Any other questions about ACPI? Do AMD uh, you know, environments look exactly the same as Intel ones from your, you know, in this world? Pretty much, yes. They're not exactly the same, but um, part of the job of the PSD is to make it look exactly the same uh -huh. for all the software that loads after it. And it does a pretty good job of that. So I know um, years ago there was a big deal made about AMD systems versus Intel systems. That's pretty much non existent anymore. You can treat them as equal. You were saying that you update the ACPICA you know, monthly. Monthly, is it, roughly. As, as Intel puts these out now, you say that part of the reason they put these out is for the new hardware that's available. Um, is that correct? In a, yes, partially yes. Okay. Partially because hardware evolves, the content of the ACPI tables changes more things are added to handle the different things that are required. So the software that interprets those tables it needs to be upgraded as well. And that is essentially what the ACPI CA is. It's the software that interprets the ACPI in your system. Yeah, so my, so my, my more so my question is, is it, is, it, is it backwards compatible enough that as we go along, if you have an older system, that you just go ahead and grab the new ACPI updates and keep going? Or is there a point where you see, think that we're going to say, you need to not? So far, it is supposed to be 100% backwards compatible. And every now and then, it's not. And they issue a revision. You know, in the next, the next month, the update, they, they fix regressions that, just like with anything. Yeah. But so far, yes, it's 100% backwards compatible. And if it ever, if I, you know, I always read the release notes before I update. And if ever something happens that I see, okay, well, this is not going to work for us, I will deal with that accordingly. But so far, that has not happened. Yes. Uh, do you also get monthly updates from AMD or? Uh... No, um, it's not. It's not Intel providing these because it's for Intel systems. It's just they are the company as part of the consortium that defines the ACPI spec. They are just the ones that publish the software. So it's almost, it's analogous to an ISO spec. Yes. Yeah, it's not, it's not Intel specific. It's not meant to be anyway. And of course, new versions are always released in the subscription package. So if you have one of those, you will always have access to the latest releases. Multimac. This is another big project sucking up a lot of time. It is essentially uh, a way of building NIC drivers that is quick and easy to add new drivers to our suite of available drivers. We originally built a library to, uh, for porting or compiling, I should say, Linux drivers. And that became unmanageable because of the rapid changes that happened in Linux and the changes to the interfaces and everything. So we went a different route. And we are now porting, or I should say compiling, FreeBSG drivers instead of Linux drivers to run under OS2. So I built this library. I call it BCL32. It's for building 32-bit drivers. All the, multi -mac, all the new multi-mac drivers are 32-bit drivers. And it helps us produce a lot of NIC drivers. So as you have seen, there's a lot of NIC drivers available now. And I also built a picture for this. A multi-MAC driver consists of essentially two pieces. The library, which is, there's actually two of them. There's a driver library and there's a compatibility library. And then the <coughs> FreeBSD driver. Now the FreeBSD driver is copied from the FreeBSD sources and compiled almost exactly as is with no modifications to run on OS2. 
and very much like the Intel ACPICA, I don't look at this code. I don't debug this code. I don't edit this code. I don't even understand how it works in some cases. I just compile it and build it and run it. Okay, so you get what you get with these drivers, with one the FreeBSD driver. Um, if it works on your hardware, then it works on your hardware. If it doesn't work on your hardware, well, I didn't write the code. <laughs> I don't debug the code and I'm not gonna edit the code. It may be fixed as when if a later version comes along, but that's about it. What we do, what I do do test for and check for and improve on is the library, which is important in some cases because it is the interface to OS2. FreeBSD drivers don't really have, they're not like OS2 drivers, where OS2 drivers is a file, it's a .sys file or a .os2 file or whatever that actually loads it from your config.sys and loads into memory and runs. FreeBSD and Linux drivers are not like that. They're compiled right into the kernel, so they don't have this other layer of interface stuff that OS2 does, and that's what that library provides. It provides the extra stuff that, to create the file and the extra interface things. But um, I forgot where I was going with that. Anyway, the thing the library can do is make, the thing I can do to debug these things is maybe not all the pieces were there because the free BSD driver may have a couple of different modules that need to be put together, um, like the physical interface modules. And I may have missed one. So if you have particular hardware and it doesn't work, there are ways that I can check. It'll be in the log file, in the Lantran log, if I manage to get all of the physical interface drivers or not. If I missed one, then I can compile it in and then it'll work for you. Otherwise, not a lot I can do if it doesn't work. But they pretty much do. For the most part, they pretty much load and run and work just fine. FreeBSD is a pretty good world from which to call this stuff. It has proven to be so far, yes. Uh -huh. They seem to be keeping things pretty well up to date. The stuff works. It's nice, clean code. Um, it's similar enough to the way OS2 does things that, that compiling them and making them work is fairly easy. It's been, it's been a really good choice so far. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's working really well. If someone reports a bug in a multi-MAC driver, how are you to know whether the problem is in your library or in the FreeBSD driver? I have quite a bit of debugging stuff to tell me things. I have put things in there so that problems that I, the common things, if they happen, they're logged in the Lantran log and I can see them. If it's not there, I will give you a special debug version which will dump a whole bunch of stuff out to a log file and it'll tell me kind of what's going on. So far there's only two drivers that I know of that I cannot make work. And I'm not sure exactly why yet. So. And there's a lot of them that work just fine. Is, the, is this all wired? These Never are all wired. This is all wired. So stuff. far, these are all wired. They're okay. easy. They're easy to deal with. And like I said, many new drivers have been built and they're released and they're, they're available now. Wireless drivers is progressing. In fact, it's progressed a lot since um, the, I last talked at Warpstock Europe. I guess I'm about 80% of the way to making the first one work. Um, that's a big, it's, it's come a long way, so I'm hoping if no emergencies or if something else sucks up a lot of my time that I may actually start trying to execute one of these and, and actually try to get it to start working. They, it was a lot more work than I originally thought. These, um, it sucks in a lot more kernel functions than the wired drivers do, so I have to implement an interface to these between the driver and OS2. A lot more coding involved. Sorry, but the PCL32 is the same for the wireless. So it's the yes, I'm, it's going to be exactly the same. It's a you essentially the built a library that, that provides what these drivers want to see as if they were running under Linux. I'm, I'm sorry, under BSD. FreeBSD. So it doesn't really matter what driver it is, the function calls are the same. Okay, you know, kind of mapping the, what OS2 provides you know, tweaking, very much like what Odin does. Kind of similar kind of thing. And then of course, they're always available in the Arkanoa subscription. When you need them, they'll always be there. I think I have a 
There may be a new release coming out fairly soon of these drivers too. USB, not a lot of time has been put into this lately. It's pretty stable. Version 11.14 is pretty stable. There are a couple of minor tweaks in the works, but nothing serious, nothing major. The last thing that came out in version 11.14 was a problem booting from USB disks. That was fixed. And I have started on a USB 3 driver. The USB disk is that the uh, does that support large drives now, externals, or just uh, flash? Um, the uh, it supported hard drives for a long time. The 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 thing that I fixed was a problem with the booting code, uh, booting the boot up sequence. Mm -hmm. Whether the type of disks that are supported are handled by the MSD driver, which we are still using the IBM version. So that's, yeah. it's, it's not, we're not, Arcanoa is not still providing that just yet. I don't know how long it's gonna be for the USB 3. Um, other things seem to always get in the way. You know how that goes. And there's only one of me, you know? And of course, when a new version comes out, it will be in the subscription package. So that's where you want to look for these things. Display drivers, another thing. We're talking about all the display drivers. Panorama, fortunately, has not sucked up a lot of time. It's pretty stable. Version 1.07 is stable. The really only issue with that is NVIDIA drivers and NVIDIA hardware. Um, I don't know how to patch the BIOS to enable custom resolutions for that. There's nothing wrong with running an NVIDIA display chipset, but um, you're stuck with the resolutions they provide you. You know, if you have a you know, high resolution screen and it doesn't, it's not supported in the BIOS, there's nothing I can do about that yet. Snap, you've heard Snap already mentioned before. It is a work in progress. It has come a long way since we acquired the source code for this. Um, we are able to build packages that run. Um, I have implemented the MTRR fixes in the snap code, so those are done. And we are able to build packages that run. So we're currently working on that, and Stephen will cover that in a lot more detail in his presentation, so I'm not going to say much more about that here. What's MTRR? Um, Briefly. Memory type range registers. It's um, they're registers which control how the CPU accesses memory, whether it will combine, whether it, whether it writes through, whether it ca um, accumulates writes and then writes it all at once. That's um, important for speeding up things like videos where you do lots of sequential writes in a row. Mm -hmm. Rather than writing each individual transaction to memory individually, it will store up a bunch of them and then do it all at once. That's, you get a lot of performance improvement by doing that. And that's, Panorama had done that had done that in the past. Remember when Panorama used to be really slow? Or it used to be fast, depending on which CPU it was running on? Well, that was all because of these registers. And that fix was implemented a long time ago in Panorama. And I essentially put exactly the same logic into Snap. So that's been implemented. And then there's more work to do. And Stephen will talk about that. Disk drivers. There is, of course, the HCI driver. It's um, stable for normal type of disk at version 1.32 at this point. There are some known issues with it. I have seen these issues and I know about them. If there were more hours in the day, I could get to all this stuff, but I know it has problems with AT, AT API devices. Um, there are various issues there. Um, they will get solved. I've been looking at them. I kind of have an idea on how to fix them. I just need to have time to implement the fixes. There is a problem that it's slower to boot disks than the Danny driver is, but we'll see if that's fixable as well. I'm not sure. But anyway, it's a fairly stable thing. It's not been sucking up a lot of time, and it's on the list. There is, of course, the Danny S506 driver. It's pretty stable, and I don't think anybody's even looked at it for quite some time. There's other drivers. 
And you thought we've already talked about all the ones that are sucking up time. Nope. There's the AMOS driver. It's got some issues. Um, it's fairly stable and reliable as of the last release version, which is depending on where you got it, is either 2.75.01 or 3.01. Um, version 3.01.01 is coming soon. Um, it has some things fixed in it with the installer primarily. It still has a scrolling issue, which I hope to get addressed before that. It's with huge containers. I don't know why anyone would, would want to put 32,000 items into a PM container, but you know. Good test. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine even being able to remember what's in 32,000 items. But anyway, <laughs> there is that issue. And it's known and, you know, it's being worked on, so a little bit of time is being spent there. JFS is also on the list of things. Um, it's stable and reliable. There are some check disk issues which are known, but they happen so rarely it will take a long, long time to track these down. Because essentially you've got to let something run for a whole day before you'll see the error. So, and then you have to make sure you capture it and then well, anyway, they're known, but anyway, that's on the list. It's a driver and sound driver. I am working on a new sound driver. It is in the works. It's gone. A, it's a long way to be completed. It's probably sixty percent done. It is built using the Drive32 and the BCL32 kits. So it will be stable and, and updatable much more than UniOd was. And another benefit of this is all the work that I'm doing on the sound driver will benefit the Multimec and the wireless project and vice versa because they're using the same compatibility stuff. So we will be seeing a new sound driver soon, and it will be up to date, and it will support the new stuff. And somebody asked about MIDI. I did not omit the MIDI driver from this code. But it have uh, input, microphone kind of input. I did not omit any of this stuff. I'm wow. compiling it as is. So, so this wow. stuff will work on modern motherboard audio chips? That's the plan, yes. Wow. I am trying to implement the entire driver. And that'll totally replace that other the unit. Yeah, yeah, that's the plan. I have yet to get it working, so we'll see. But <laughs> it has come a long, long way. In fact, um, just last week I finished the. Um, there's a couple of stages when you're building a brand new project. There's a, especially when you're trying to port software from another platform. Is first thing you have to do is get it to compile. Yeah. You got to get all the compiler problems done. You got to get all the modules linking together properly. All the functions that it needs need to be implemented so that you don't get unresolved externals. Um, that phase of the project was completed a week ago. Okay, so I am now ready to start actually running the thing and now fixing all the runtime problems that you come up with. So that's the next stage. And what, but once you get to the runtime problems, you're quite a ways into it, and it's it's getting pretty well done. So anyway, that's coming as something to look forward to. So sound problems hopefully will be all resolved when I finally produce this thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, what happens if you download one of these things and then you have problems? We call you. I call me? <laughs> <laughs> Well, there are some things you can do. Read the docs. <laughs> Read the README. Sometimes, sometimes these things are, are mentioned. If the common things will be mentioned. And the wiki is a great place because the docs and the README ship with the product. And when things happen afterwards and I find out, I'll document it and I'll put it on the wiki. The wiki is the most up-to-date documentation for problems and things. And everybody knows where that is, right? arkanoa.com. In the upper right hand corner, you'll see a little tab that says support. If you hover over that or click on it, you'll see something that says wiki. That's where it is. 
There's lots of very useful information there. Is the problem really reproducible, or did it happen just once? This is kind of important because, well, if you can't reproduce it, how can we fix it? <laughs> why you would you be worried about it if you yeah. can't? Why, exactly, <laughs> and that's true. Why would you be worried about it if it, doesn't, if it doesn't keep happening? If it only happened once, maybe you had a power glitch, or maybe, you know, who knows what happened. See if you can reproduce it. This is another thing that I see when people um, report problems. Is your config.sys a horrible mess, or is it? It always looks like a horrible mess. <laughs> it doesn't have to. I mean, I've seen things where the same thing is defined several times. You know, you got to set something, and it's in there three times. And you know, you're looking at the first one thinking that's how you have things set, but there's two more down later that's changing it for you. Are you using the latest drivers? Maybe something already got fixed and you don't know about it because you're still using an older driver. Do you have something that's unsupported or maybe not quite compatible? Check these things. Why? Because, well, there's not a whole lot of developers working on this stuff. And there's not a whole lot of time. So the more you can do to help troubleshoot something, the better off everybody will be. If you're having a problem, you know, think about it. Could it be something else? <laughs> you know, hardware. Maybe, maybe your power supply went bad. Maybe your disk drive has having a bad spot on it. Maybe something else is going on. You never know. So you've determined you've got a real problem. So now what? What are you going to do? Go complain to somebody else? Go complain to your neighbor? Go to a forum? Go to a mailing list? Tell you what, if you do that, I will never know about it or see it, and it's not a problem in my mind. <laughs> Think about opening a ticket. Where? Arkanoa.com. Yes. Keep in mind that there's not many of us developers. And in fact, how many people are working on device drivers? One. One. <laughs> and think about how many device drivers I just went through that are products that we ship. Well, there's a lot of them, and there's not a whole lot of time. So keep that in mind. We're all really busy. So try to isolate it as best you can. <laughs> try to figure out exactly what's happening. Document it, capture logs, do what you can so that you know, once I open, when I look at the ticket, I'm saying, okay, where's all the information? It takes me time. It's like, okay, where's the test log? Where's this? Where's that? You know, tell me more about it. It helps a lot. It helps save time. And, and, and you know, you may figure out the problem anyway. If you think you really do have a problem, don't be shy about opening a ticket. It is really the only way we know that something is not right. We want to know, because personally, I like the drivers to work perfectly in all situations every time. You know, that's really hard to achieve, but you know, I don't like it when people have trouble. I'd like them to work. And if you have trouble, as long as it's, you know, what it's supposed to be doing in the first place, I'd like to try and make it work properly. And I will do the best that I can, given the amount of time that I have to work with. Plus, if you don't open a ticket, there's no way to track the progress or the track that the, there is a problem and then what is being done to try and track it down and fix it. If you, you know, just post something in a news group or something, there's no tracking there. That's why we want tickets, open tickets. So how do you do that? Go to arcanoa.com and you can, get, you can get at it from the main page through that support link or you can type in mantis.arcanoa.com and get you to the same place. Open a ticket. Please keep one system and one problem per ticket. It's much easier to track that way. Don't open a ticket and list a whole bunch of things. Because then what happens when you fix the first one, then how do you, the tracking goes away. You can't keep track of what's going on. Keep in mind, there's only one of me, and I'm working juggling a lot of different projects. And I, I use the ticket system a lot to keep track of, OK, I, I, 
I open the thing up and I look at all the different things and depending on what I'm working on at the time, I'll pick the things that I want, want to try and fix. So if you got two or three things layered down and the subject, the, the, the summary doesn't say what's down in the ticket, then I'm never going to know about it unless I actually open it up. When you open a ticket, provide appropriate, appropriate data, please. When you pick your summary, you know, that, that one line or thing at the top, pick something that actually describes what the problem is. And try to avoid putting version numbers in the summary. Because a new release may come out and the problem might still be there. So just, you know, something like problem with version 3.1 of Panorama. That's not a good summary. It doesn't tell me what the problem is. I don't really care what version it is. I'm assuming you're using the version, the latest version, right? Plus, there's a place to put the version number in the ticket. It doesn't have to be in the summary. So put a nice, clear description in it. How do I reproduce the problem if I'm going to try and fix it? Please tell me how to do that. Don't just say, install the driver and reboot. Because assume that I've already done that, and it didn't happen for me. Believe it or not, every driver that I release is thoroughly tested before release. ACPI package has three to four weeks of testing before it actually makes it to public. Every time, it is thoroughly tested. So assume it's been tested, and the fact that you're having a problem is kind of unique to your situation. So I need to know what's unique, what's not standard, what's unusual. Otherwise, I can't reproduce it. And then once your problem's fixed, don't come up with another one in the same ticket. I call that ticket creep. Again, it's the same thing. If you have a different problem, please open another ticket. Once again, it comes back to tracking. I need to be able to track it because this is how I work. You know, I'll be working on Multimac one day, okay? And I think, okay, I fix a problem, I could, I'll go look at the tickets and say, okay, what else can I work on while I'm working on this thing? And I'll look through them all, okay, that one, I'll try and fix that one because I can see, I can read the little one-liners. Okay, I don't go looking through every ticket looking for work to do. Believe me, I don't need to look for work to do. <laughs> that makes sense? And then one other thing that really helps me, if I ask you to do something, please do it exactly the way I say. Don't take shortcuts, don't do what you think I meant. Because I kind of understand how the software is following, what the code paths are. And if I tell you to do something in a certain order, that means I'm, in my mind, I'm thinking how the driver is processing things, and I'm testing a code path, and I'm seeing how it reacts based on what I've asked you to do. And based on those results, it tells me, okay, I need to fix that, or I need to go look somewhere else. Okay, any questions? Reporting problems. Really important, because we really want to know about this stuff, because we really want ARCA OS to be the best that it can be, because, you know, we're it, right? I always wanted to put something in here about choosing hardware, because we all need to pick new systems. This is the best criteria I can give you for picking a system to run OS2 on. You want to choose quality, generic, standards compliant hardware. Now, if you think back 20 years or so, OS2 has always, always been this way. OS2 has always needed quality hardware to run on. Remember, right? Back in the 80s, back in the 90s, when you ran OS2, you needed to have good hardware, or it, wouldn't, it won't run on the cheap stuff. That is still true today. That's, there's my second line. Don't buy the cheapest thing you can find. It probably won't work. And if it does, you're going to have problems with it and stay away from NVIDIA chipsets. Not necessarily NVIDIA video, but NVIDIA main board chipsets. They are not standards compliant, and we have trouble running on those, and they're problems that I cannot fix. You're okay with AMD chipsets, you're okay with Intel chipsets. I don't know what else is there. Any questions about hardware? I notice a lot of people go with ThinkPads or Lenovo. Those are good. I have ThinkPads. I've installed on Dell's. 
I've installed on Sony's. They're okay. Acer hardware. No. <laughs> <laughs> Asus works pretty well. I have a lot of Asus motherboards in my test lab. They're okay. Nice fast, fast equipment. Any other questions? Wireless. Wireless. I didn't mention that. I know Everybody wants that. wireless. I know. I'm working on it. And actually, it's come a long way. It's come a long way. Um, I was just looking at it today while I was listening to some of the other presentations. I noticed, remember I talked about the different phases? There's the getting it to compile phase. The wireless is still in getting it to compile phase. And I am working on the Intel wireless driver first. Good. That's um, good work. When, <laughs> I, when I started out, there were... 50 or so unimplemented functions that I needed to implement in the library to get it to work. Today, there are 11. Okay, that's come a long way. And the last few, of course, are the most difficult ones, but, you know, if the end is in sight, 11 is a lot less than more than 50. So, you know, it's coming along really quick. What's the world of wireless chipsets? Is there just a dozen or so, or, you know, families? You know, I was whatever. looking at that today. Somebody <laughs> asked me about a Realtek wireless chip, so I went and looked to see what's available, yes. Um, I found three. I found two Intel ones and a Broadcom one. Plus Realtek, you mean? Oh. I didn't see Realtek in there. Now, I don't know, I haven't looked in great detail yet about whether that particular chip is supported by something else. I, don't, I just don't know just yet. Oh, this is in the BSD? This is in the BSD repository. driver set, yes. So time to buy a new car here? I don't know yet. I, I, I just took, a, it took a two or three minutes to look uh -huh. okay. through the sources and see if I could find that. Um, I'm not as familiar with the wireless driver set as I am with the wired driver set, so I need to, I need to look at it. I know everybody wants wireless, everybody wants sound, and everybody wants everything. <laughs> and they're just complicated drivers. They, they just are. They're complicated. They're, they take some work to, to build. Sure. Hmm. There is a question if, uh, if there is any plan to support XFAT for larger uh, ex external USB drives. I don't know the answer to that. Anybody else know the answer to that? What was the question? No. Is there, I'm sorry, is there plans to support XFAT as a file system? Well, here's the problem with XFAT. XFAT is patented by Microsoft. Uh, Arkanoa cannot and will not release an XFAT driver commercially, nor will we, nor will we release a driver on our site that includes XFAT support because we're not licensed for it. We contacted Microsoft about licensing XFAT. Microsoft is really only interested in licensing XFAT technology to hardware manufacturers for devices like cameras and cell phones. Other than that, they are not interested in licensing XFAT to operating systems. Now there is a, a questionably open source XFAT implementation available that was open sourced by Sanya, uh, sorry, Samsung. The question is whether Samsung had the right to GPL the source when they GPL the source. Um, that's still up for grabs. So as a result, Arkanoe's position is that we are not going to have anything to do with XFAT. Now that doesn't mean that an enterprising developer could not develop an XFAT IFS or an XFAT plugin for NetDrive. I mean, it could certainly be done, and the code is out there to do it. But Arkanoe will not have anything to do with that project. You're not going to have an Arkanoe camera that you can then fly. Oh man! <laughs> <laughs> we, we have no answers right now. Down. Believe me. Now, the, the weird thing about it is the enterprising developer sets up a remote RPM. 
Well, yeah, if, look, if the package is available via, via some RPM repository, an Arkanoi package manager is certainly capable of handling third-party repositories, then you can certainly install and, and update that driver through Arkanoi Package Manager. <coughs> That's not a problem for us whatsoever. But we can't fund that development and we will not distribute the driver on our right. site. Because we're not licensed to do that. There you go. That's it. Thank you. All right, thank you much.